Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger, your state senator, or your state senator for the moment, since you're listening in. I'd like to welcome you all who are viewing on Zoom and Facebook, or who might be calling in to our last, um, uh, to our discussion of Medicare parts A, B, and C, and D, changes you can make to your coverage. This is very important information because you have options every year and it's crucial that you know what those options are. As always, we have closed captioning for today's event. As a viewer, you have to activate closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you're in Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're in Facebook Live, you will see a setting button in the bottom right-hand corner of the video. Click on CC for closed captioning to activate the process. Again, we have found this very valuable, even if your hearing is not 100%, but still pretty good, reading the captions along really help us absorb the information. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email with links to the event video an event survey and the resources that are posted in the chat within a few days along with the presenter's PowerPoint. So don't think you have to scribble down everything you're hearing because you're going to get all of the information forward to you afterwards. And now moving on. As you know, we are in the midst of the Medicare open enrollment period, which is from October 15th to December 7th. You have likely been seeing a lot of Medicare commercials, ads, and mailers encouraging you to sign up for a specific type of Medicare coverage or a specific plan. Making decisions about what Medicare coverage to pick at the best price can be confusing, and the right answer for one person isn't necessarily the right answer for another person. Today, we'll be hearing from Eric Hausman, who is the Volunteer Outreach Manager from the New York City Department for the Aging's Health Insurance Information and Counseling Program, HICAP. Eric is an expert in all things Medicare and has a major following among my constituents. Eric has worked with us on webinars before, and again, he just gets a bigger following every time he explains changes in Medicare. Eric's going to explain our updates for through 2025, including information about changes in premium rates and deductibles for Medicare Part A and B, and changes to Part D, your prescription drug coverage, crucial for many of us. Additionally, you will learn about Medicare Advantage and supplemental plans and programs that can help defray Medicare costs for some people including drug prescription costs, but others have found that it's not really a good deal for them at all. A lot of useful information will be shared during this town call. Again, don't worry if you miss something. You'll be able to watch the event a video in a few days and have a master list of all the resources we're referring to during today's presentation. We received a very large number of questions in advance and I'm sure we will get more as the event goes on. Eric will do his best to answer as many general questions as time allows. We will not be able to answer specific questions about your individual coverage. For specific questions, or if you've submitted a general question we are unable to get to today, please call the HICAP phone number H-I-I-C-A-P, the telephone number is 212-602-4180. The number is in the, and the website is listed in the chat. 212-602-4180. I have to say, Department for the Aging's high cap program is one of the secret bright stars of city government. The town hall is a general information session on Medicare, particularly designed for individuals who will turn 65 soon or are seeking to make changes in their current Medicare coverage during the enrollment period. Remember that period ends on December 7th. 
So if you are going to make changes or are new to Medicare and need to sign up for certain things for the first time, remember that deadline, December 7th. It's now my pleasure to introduce her, Eric Hausman. Hi, Eric. Thank you, Senator Kruger. So um, today I'm going to be doing an overview of Medicare, but also sharing important updates for 2025. So let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So let's start with enrollment. Now, whenever I talk to people that are just Eric, becoming Medicare eligible, your PowerPoint isn't being shared right now. One sec, let me see if I can. I'll share the screen again. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Sure, so whenever I speak to people that are new to Medicare, that are just turning 65, my first question to them is always, are you collecting social security? Because I know if somebody's collecting Social Security prior to 65, they're going to be automatically enrolled in Medicare. But nowadays, many people are choosing to collect Social Security after 65. If that's your situation, you will not be automatically enrolled in Medicare. You will not. It will be up to you to enroll in Medicare Part B during one of the Part B enrollment periods. The first enrollment period is called the initial enrollment period. This is when people are first eligible for Medicare. It's a seven month period. For most people, it's a seven months surrounding the month they turn 65. If you enroll in Medicare Part B in any of the three months prior to the month you turn 65, Medicare will start the first of the month you turn 65. If you enroll in Medicare Part B, the month you turn 65 or one of the next three months, Medicare Part B will start the first of the next month. Now, some people, when they turn 65, they're still working or they're covered under a spouse, not a domestic partner, but a spouse that they're married to at 65 who's still working. And especially if they're working for a large employer where the employer insurance would be their primary, their main insurance, they may want to delay enrollment in Part B. Why? To save the monthly premium. If that's your situation and you are covered at 65 under your own or your spouse's active current employment, not retiree plan, not COBRA, but active current employment, you could delay Part B, save the premium, and sign up later using what they call the special enrollment period. So if you're turning 65, for instance, but you're still covered under your spouse who's working for the city of New York, you can delay Part B. And then a couple of years later, when your spouse is ready to retire, sign up for Part B then without having to wait and without any penalty. And that's very common for people that are still working or covered under a spouse who's still working for a large employer when they become 65. For the people that don't sign up during the initial enrollment period, who don't qualify or maybe miss the special enrollment period, and then realize later they need Part B, they make them wait till an annual period to sign up. It's called the general enrollment period. Every year, January through March, if you sign up during that time, Part B starts the first of the next month. But you may be subject to a penalty. The penalty is 10% for that year's standard premium for every full 12 months you delay. And that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100% or more penalty, it's not one-time penalty. You pay that for the rest of your life. So I just want to stress to everybody, the only people that can delay Part B and sign up later without having to wait and without being subject to the penalty are the people that are covered at 65 under their own or their spouse's active current employment. Now, once you do enroll in Medicare, they'll send you this red, white, and blue Medicare card in the mail, and it shows you the two parts of Medicare. Medicare Part A is your hospital insurance, covers you if you ever need to be admitted to the hospital. Medicare Part B is your medical insurance, covers you mostly for doctor services. And in the next section, we'll talk about the cost sharing 
that people with Medicare are responsible for, starting with the Medicare Part B premium. Now, most people get Part A hospital insurance for free, but no premium. But Medicare Part B, people pay for that. So this year, the standard Part B premium, it's $174.70, and next year they just announced it'll be $185. So that means if you're collecting Social Security next year, they'll be taking that $185 out of your monthly Social Security check. That's the standard premium. That's what most people pay for Part B. But some people actually pay a higher premium because they have a higher income. And for next year, we're talking about people whose incomes are above 106,000 for a single, 212,000 for a married couple. So to determine your premium for 2025, they're gonna look at your 2023 tax return. And if you are what they call modified adjusted gross income from 2023 is above this threshold, you're gonna get a notice from Social Security that you're gonna pay a higher Part B premium for next year based on that 2023 return. Besides a monthly premium for Part B, there's an annual deductible. This year it's 240, next year it's going up to 257, and that means the first 257 in covered medical expenses next year, that will be your responsibility. Once you meet the deductible for most services, Medicare pays 80% of what they allow, you're responsible for the other 20% the Medicare co-insurance. That's how it is with original Medicare for Part B medical insurance. Part A hospital insurance, very different. Although most people get Part A for free for no premium, there's a large deductible if you need to go admit, to be admitted to the hospital. And it goes up every year. So next year, the inpatient deductible, the Part A deductible for an admission of up to 60 days will be $1,676. If you're in the hospital beyond 60 days next year, for the 61st through the 90th day in the hospital, you're responsible for a daily copayment. It's gonna be $419 per day, per day. And if you think that's a lot, if you're in the hospital beyond 90 days next year, there's an additional 60, what they call lifetime reserve days, which you can use once during the lifetime of your Medicare coverage in any combination. But once you've used them, that's it. They're non-renewable. So those 60 lifetime reserve days, you're responsible for a daily copayment, $838 per day for those 60 additional days. If you discharge from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility for rehab care, Medicare pays the first 20 days there in full. The next 80 days, you're responsible for a daily copayment. Next year, $209.50 per day for those additional 80 days. Now, these Part A benefits, they're not a calendar year benefit like Medicare Part B. Part B is fairly simple. You know, you got one deductible, 257 next year. Once you've met it, that's it. You're done for the year. But the Part A deductible, somebody may have to meet that more than once in the same calendar year, because it's once per what they call a benefit period. And a benefit period begins the first day you're admitted to the hospital, and it ends when you've been out of the hospital, out of the skilled nursing facility, for a period of at least 60 consecutive days, at which point your benefits renew, they start again. So for instance, let's say you need to be admitted to the hospital in January next year for five days. Medicare is gonna pay everything except that deductible, 1676. But what if in February you need to be readmitted to the hospital or a different hospital? Same condition, different condition, doesn't matter. Less than 60 days have gone by since you were discharged. You're still in the same benefit period. You just pick up what, where you left off at day number six of your first 60 days of coverage. But let's say instead of being readmitted in February, what if you were admitted three, four, five, six months later? Still the same calendar year, it's still 2025, but now it's a new benefit period. More than 60 days have gone by since your discharge. Your benefits renew, they start again. You're back to day number one of your first 60 days of coverage, and you have to meet a new deductible. So I hope this slide will help to point out the importance of people having other insurance besides Medicare. 
And when I talk later about Medigap, Medicare Supplement Insurance, you'll see how that fills in very nicely here. Now, so far today, I'm talking about one way to get Medicare. Original, traditional Medicare, Part A hospital insurance, Part B medical insurance, and about the gaps in coverage, deductibles, co-insurance. Another gap with original Medicare are services that Medicare just doesn't pay for at all. These are the more common services, including dental care. Medicare does not cover a routine vision exam, nor do they cover eyeglasses. There's an asterisk there because Medicare does pay for one pair of eyeglasses following cataract surgery. Otherwise, they don't cover eyeglasses. They don't cover hearing aids. And important to know, Medicare does not cover long-term care. Medicare covers what you saw on the last slide, short-term rehab care in a skilled nursing facility following a hospital discharge. Also important to know is that original traditional Medicare does not and never did cover a routine annual physical exam. Now, in the Medicare literature, you might see that they cover something called an annual wellness visit for all people with Part B. That's a much more limited exam. A comprehensive head-to-toe annual physical exam, not covered by Medicare. And if that's the service you receive, that's entirely out of your pocket. Also, it could be important to know that Medicare does not cover services outside of the United States and its territories, including Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So if you're traveling outside the United States and its territories, you would want to find out if you have other insurance, which might pay for foreign travel emergency services, or if not, you might want to purchase travel insurance. But Medicare outside the United States and its territories, no coverage. So again, so far today, we're talking about one way to get Medicare, original, traditional Medicare, and about the gaps in coverage. Now let's talk about filling in the gaps. Some people on the call today, I bet, have retiree health insurance from their own or their spouse's former employer, including we speak to many New York City retirees, retired teachers and others, and most of the retired City of New York employees who have Medicare choose the GHI Senior Care as their supplemental coverage. GHI Senior Care, it's actually a combination of Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield, which supplements Part A, and GHI Emblem, which supplements Part B. The GHI Senior Care does not cover the Part B deductible, the 257 deductible next year, plus they have their own $50 deductible on top of that. But once you meet the two deductibles, currently the GHI Senior Care will pay the 20% Part B coinsurance. However, they are going to change for next year. In addition to these two deductibles, instead of paying the entire 20% coinsurance, the GHI Senior Care will have $15 copayments for many services, including for office visits. I included a link here to the New York City Office of Labor Relations website, where it has the copy of the mailing that they sent to New York City retirees with a listing of all the services that will be subject to that $15 copayment. So that's the first change I wanted to tell you about today, besides the new Part A and Part B numbers. Now, for those that do not have retiree health insurance, okay, some of them have very limited income and resources, and they might qualify for Medicaid in addition to Medicare, in which case Medicaid can fill in the gaps. But most people today don't have retiree health insurance, and they don't qualify for Medicaid. So what do they do? They can purchase a private Medigap a Medicare supplement plan. You may have seen them advertised on TV from AARP. Medigap plans are identified by letter. There are 10 standard plans. We have a chart here to show you what the 10 plans cover, letters A through N. All Medigap plans, though, they cover certain things. They all cover the coinsurance for days 61 through 90 in the hospital. They all cover the 60 lifetime reserve days, the coinsurance for that. 
And most Medigap plans pay the Part A deductible, the hospital deductible, and most Medigap plans also pay the 20% Part B coinsurance. And then other benefits vary from plan to plan. So let me tell you the two most important things to know about Medigap insurance. One is that the benefits are standard. So different companies sell these plans and they charge different amounts. But as long as it's the same letter plan, doesn't matter what they're charging. It's exactly the same coverage, exactly the same. So it's well worth your while to shop around for the best deal on a Medigap plan. The other thing to know about Medigap insurance in New York State, unlike most states, we have continuous open enrollment for Medigap. So as long as you have A and B and you're on original Medicare and you live in New York State, you could purchase the Medigap plan anytime, anytime at all. And if you have a Medigap plan already, you could switch it anytime. If not with the same insurer, by going to a different insurer. You could not be denied Medigap insurance in New York State because of your age or because of your health. Now let me just point out a couple of things from this chart. First of all, I want to tell you about something that changed a few years ago, and that is with Plan C and Plan F. You notice that F is the most comprehensive Medigap plan. These are the only two plans that cover the Part B deductible, that 257 deductible next year. What changed was new people to Medicare cannot get these plans. These plans are only available to people that became Medicare eligible prior to 2020. If I'm talking to somebody that's becoming Medicare eligible now, I'll talk to them about Plan G, as that's the most comprehensive plan they could buy. And the only difference between F and G is that G does not cover that annual Part B deductible. But G can be expensive. If they're looking for a lower cost Medigap plan, I would then talk to them about Plan N as in Nancy. The main difference between G and N is that N for office visits does not cover the entire 20% coinsurance. Instead, with Plan N, for office visits, you have a copayment of up to $20. But because you do, they're able to offer that at a lower premium. If you're looking, though, for the cheapest Medigap plan possible, that's the high deductible version of Plan F or Plan G. You'll notice those two plans have an asterisk next to them. That's because there's a second version of these plans. It covers everything the standard F or G covers, but before they pay anything, you have to meet a deductible. Next year, the deductible you'll see is going to be $28.70. So let's say you have high deductible G and you have to be admitted to the hospital, that $16.76 deductible would go towards the $28.70. The $257 Part B deductible would go towards that. The 20% coinsurance, the same thing. And if you reach that deductible, you would get all the benefits of the standard effort G for the remainder of the calendar year while saving on the premium over the course of the year. So let's talk about premiums. There are rate increases that will go into effect for many plans from Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield is not selling new plans to new members, but current members are able to keep their plans. Also with Emblem and AARP United Healthcare. So let's take a look at that Plan G. Plan G from Empire next year is going to be over $400. Emblem offers it at the lowest rate, currently 302, but come January, it's going to be 362.40. AARP, as a result, Plan G, starting January, will have the lowest rate, 326.75. So if I was somebody that had Plan G hey, and lived in the greater New York City area with Emblem, and I got the notice about that rate increase, I would think that maybe I should switch to AERP if I want to keep the play, same Plan G, have exactly the same coverage, and pay less money. And knowing that, if I live in New York State, I could always make that change. If you want to see the current Medigap rates, you can see them at this link. And they've also posted on the New York State Department of Financial Services website, dfs.ny.gov the new January 2025 rates. 
So, so far I'm talking about one way to get Medicare, original traditional Medicare, which could come along with a supplemental plan through a former employer, through Medicaid, or through a privately purchased Medigap plan. Now I want to talk about the other way to get Medicare, which is to join a Medicare Advantage plan, a Medicare um, health plan. This is Part C of Medicare. Nobody calls it Part C, though. It's uh, Medicare Advantage. And these are private plans that are contracted with Medicare to provide all of your Medicare benefits through a network of doctors and hospitals, through doctors and hospitals that participate, that accept the plan. These are the companies that send you so much mail every day, right, or that you see advertised, whether it's Aetna or Anthem or Center's Plan, right, or Elder Plan or um, an Emblem or Fidelis or Health First or Humana or United Healthcare or Metro Plus or VNS Health, WellCare. Many companies offer those plans. And most everybody's eligible to join. You just have to have A and B of Medicare and live in the service area of the plan. That's it. But unlike Medigap insurance, if you live in New York State and you're on original Medicare, you can enroll or switch plans from one insurer to another at any time. But Medicare Advantage for most people, there are only certain times of the year that they're able to sign up or switch. And we're in one of those times right now. So as you heard earlier, people can enroll in a plan during the annual election period, which begins every year October 15th and runs through December 7th. If you sign up for a plan today, your new plan starts January 1st. If in January you realize that was a mistake, fortunately there's another enrollment period called the open enrollment period. Every year from January through March, anybody that's on a Medicare Advantage plan has one additional opportunity to either switch to another Medicare Advantage plan or to switch to original Medicare one time, January through March, to start the first of the next month. After March, for most people, whatever plan you're in, if you're in a plan at all, that's what you're going to have for the rest of the year. And it's important to remember if you join a Medicare Advantage plan, you're not giving up your Medicare benefits. These private plans are required to cover whatever Medicare covers, plus as an incentive to join, they will cover to a limited extent some services Medicare does not. So they typically provide limited coverage for things like dental, vision, eyeglasses, hearing aid. They probably pay for that routine physical that Medicare doesn't. They might pay for a gym membership for you. All things not covered by Medicare. But what I think is the biggest incentive, especially in our area, is that plans may be available for as low as zero premium. I bet you've seen them advertise zero premium. You're still going to pay that Part B premium, 185 next year or whatever you're paying for Part B. They are saying zero additional premium. But even if the plan has no premium, that doesn't mean the plan has no cost for you. It's going to cost you on the other end when you access care usually in the form of a copayment. So for instance, many Medicare Advantage plans have no copayments for primary care doctors, but they all have copayments for specialists. Some are as high as 50 or $55. If you're admitted to the hospital, most plans have a daily copayment up to a maximum number of days, 200, 300, 400 or more dollars per day for the first three, four, five, six days in the hospital. If you need physical therapy or mental health, many plans have a $40 copayment per visit. So the bottom line with the Medicare Advantage plan is not 100% coverage for most services under most plans. And you're going to pay something at the end of the day, copayment or coinsurance, when you access care. But in fairness to the plans, all plans have a maximum out-of-pocket limit for all Part A and Part B for hospital and medical covered services combined. Next year, this could be as high as $9,350 in network. So if you have a plan with a $9,350 limit and you're paying $40 each time you see your specialist, that $40 copayment is going towards the limit. 
if you're admitted to the hospital and your plan has a $400 daily copayment for the first three days, that $1,200 out of your pocket goes towards the limit. If you reach that limit, most people won't, but if you do, 100% coverage for the remainder of the year for all Part A and Part B covered services. $9,350 is the highest limit any plan can have in network next year. Some plans have that limit. Other plans have lower limits. And that's something you may want to compare when you're looking at different Medicare Advantage plans, especially if you're concerned about having high out-of-pocket costs for medical care in the next calendar year. The other thing you have to look at is the type of Medicare Advantage plans. Historically, in New York City, we've had mostly HMO plans. With an HMO plan, unless it's an emergency, you're limited to doctors and hospitals that participate, that accept the plan. But some companies offer PPO, preferred provider organization plans. Like the HMO, they also have a network of doctors and hospitals. And if you use their providers, you pay whatever copayment the plan has. The big difference with the PPO is you can go outside of the network. The doctors and hospitals that take Medicare but just don't accept the plan. And you might pay more out of pocket when you do, sometimes substantially more out of pocket. You might even have to pay up front and then seek reimbursement from the plan. But for that reason, the PPO gives you more choice, more flexibility than does the stricter HMO plan. Now, there are some people that have Medicare that also have Medicaid. We call them dual eligible beneficiaries. And if you have both Medicare and Medicaid, that you're eligible for a certain type of Medicare Advantage plan called the Special Needs Plan, the DSNP. It's only for people with Medicare and Medicaid. Like other HMO plans, you're limited to a network of providers, but as long as your providers are participating in the plan, whatever company you get the plan from, there's no copayments for covered services for doctor and for hospital. And with the special needs plan, oftentimes they will provide a significant over-the-counter benefit, OTC. So this is an additional benefit that you wouldn't have with Medicare itself, where you get a certain amount of money per month or per calendar quarter that you can use for non-prescription drugs, things like Band-Aids and for vitamins. Sometimes you might be able to use it for food. You might be able to use it towards your, paying your utilities, all as an incentive to join. But you can't just join a plan for the OTC card, because when you join a plan, like any Medicare Advantage plan, it's taking the place of original traditional Medicare. And it only works for you if your doctors are participating in the plan. And it covers your drugs at your pharmacy. Okay, and we'll talk about the drug coverage, the Part D, coming up in the next section. But before I do, I want to tell you about something that's happening with certain Medicare Advantage plans this year. So Aetna, United Healthcare, and WellCare all have Medicare Advantage plans that are terminating at the end of the year. And if their members that are in a terminating plan currently do not choose a new plan, Come January 1st, they'll be on original traditional Medicare because original Medicare is always the default coverage. Now, bear in mind, these same three insurers, Aetna, United Healthcare, and WellCare, they still offer plans for next year, multiple plans, in fact, for next year. But in order to remain with a plan with the same insurer, you would need to actively enroll in that plan. It's not going to happen automatically for anybody you would have to take the step to actively enroll. Now, ideally, people would choose a new plan that are in this situation by the end of the enrollment period, December 7th. However, if they miss the deadline, they're entitled to a special enrollment period for people whose plans are terminating. It'll begin December 8th and run through the end of February. So if you don't realize that your United Healthcare plan terminated, now it's the middle of December, not a problem you can still enroll in a plan to start January 1st. Some people, though, are not going to realize their plan terminates until the first time they use the plan in January or February to go to the doctor, to get a prescription at the pharmacy. If that's the case, you could still use the special enrollment period through the end of February 
to enroll into a new plan to start the first of the next month. Let's talk next about Part D. D is the prescription drug coverage. There are two ways that people get Medicare Part D. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, Part D is easy. It's included with the plan. So if you're going to be on Health First HMO next year, you're going to get your drug coverage from Health First. If you're going to be in Aetna's PPO, you'll get your drug coverage from Aetna. Because if you go with a Medicare Advantage plan, you get all your Medicare benefits. Part A Hospital, Part B Medical, Part D Drug, all from one plan. If instead you choose original traditional Medicare with or without supplemental coverage, you could purchase a separate standalone drug plan to go along with that. This year in New York State, we have 15 of those plans to choose from. Next year, it'll be down to 12. Those plans each have their own formulary, their own list of covered drugs. So not every plan necessarily covers all your drugs. And they got their own network of pharmacies. So the pharmacy you like, maybe they don't take all 12 plans. How do you compare so many plans? You have to go to the Medicare website, medicare.gov. They have this plan finder search tool where if you enter your drug name, the strength, the dosage, the quantity you take each month, and select your pharmacy, that search tool will compare every plan and rank them based on your individual needs from least expensive to most expensive. If you're not comfortable using the website, you can simply call 1-800-MEDICARE. They're open 24-7. You can always reach them. If you want local assistance, that's our program, the HICAP program. All of our counselors are very familiar with the website. Sometimes pharmacies even advertise they'll do this for you. We're all going to the same website to make the same comparison. And what I tell people is you can't just do this once in your lifetime and think that you're done. Because these plans can and do change every year. So everybody that's on an Advantage plan, that's on a Part D plan, they should have gotten a notice from the plan by the end of September about changes for next year. They update the website the beginning of October. And now's the time to compare plans. And if you find a better plan for next year, you can enroll in that same annual election period through December 7th to be effective January 1. Now these Part D plans each have these 12 plans a monthly premium, and some of those premiums have increased for next year. So one plan this year, next year, is a little less than $40 a month, but other plans cost over $100 a month. Besides a monthly premium for Part D, you can have a deductible. Next year, it could be as high as $590. Some plans have a $590 deductible for next year. Some have a lesser deductible. Some have zero deductible. And now here's the biggest change to tell you about for 2025. Next year, for the first time, all Part D plans will have a new out-of-pocket limit of an even $2,000. And that amount subject to change each year. That $2,000 does not include your premium, does not. It includes what you pay at the pharmacy for covered drugs. So it includes your deductible, your co-payments, your co-insurance, if you reach that limit, 100% coverage for the rest of the year for all our covered drugs. Now, connected to that is the Medicare prescription payment plan, where they allow you to take that 2000 and spread it out over the course of the year into monthly payments. That could be very helpful for somebody who has very high out-of-pocket costs, <clears throat> who ordinarily would have to pay that 2000 next year in the first month or two or three, and they don't have to. If they sign up for the Medicare prescription payment plan, which you could do at any time and is offered by every plan, then you will pay nothing at the pharmacy, zero for covered drugs. Instead, your Part D plan will bill you. The same way they bill you the monthly premium, they will bill you your monthly cost sharing. So the, if you want more information on the Medicare prescription payment plan, I would recommend this publication. Also on the Medicare website, they have a Q&A that you can go through to um, find out if the plan finder is something that would be beneficial for you. 
So we said that there are 15 plans currently, and they're going to be down to 12 next year. Three plans are being terminated. One of them is from Aetna. Two of them are from Aetna SilverScript, the uh, Medicare SilverScript Plus plan and the Medicare SilverScript Smart Saver. Instead of saying those plans are being terminated, though, I should really say that the members in those plans are going to be automatically moved. They will not be terminated. Instead, if they do nothing, they will be automatically moved to the one remaining SilverScript plan, the SilverScript Choice plan, and that's what they will have for January 1. And then United Healthcare has the United Healthcare AARP Medicare RX preferred from United Healthcare plan. This plan is also terminating, and the members are going to be automatically moved to another United Healthcare plan. Um, and then the, United, the new United Healthcare plan is going to assume the name of this plan, so they may not even notice that change. And again, I sh let's not say that the plans are terminating, because unlike the Medicare Advantage plans, which are terminating, and if you don't choose the plan, you'll just be on original Medicare. With these plans, they although they're no longer continuing these plans for next year, if you do not choose a new plan, you will still be on a plan, a Part D plan, a different Part D plan from the same insurer. Now, we're getting a lot of calls from people that have a RD plan from WellCare, the WellCare Value Script plan. Currently, that plan is $3.70 per month. Next year, it's going up to $38.70, a big change for next year. It's still going to be the lowest premium plan of the 12, but again, a much higher premium for 2025 than we have for 2024. So what I would recommend is for people that take medications that may be on this plan or any plan, don't just look at the premium, but look at the overall cost of your drugs. Because even if you're paying more in premium, the cost savings to you from being from one plan to another based on your drugs and your pharmacy, it might be beneficial to make a change for next year. And then I'm going to talk in this last section about programs that help people with their Medicare costs. The first is called Extra Help, or the Low Income Subsidy. This is a subsidy the government provides to help people with their Part D drug costs. Most people we see that get this benefit get it automatically because they have either Medicaid and or the Medicare Savings Program, where the state pays their Part B premium. If they do not have Medicaid, though, and they do not have a Medicare savings program, but they have limited income and resources, they can apply to Social Security to see if they can qualify for extra help. If you get extra help, you can get a Part D plan for zero premium, no deductible, and only small copayments for your drugs going up to $490 to, for generic drugs, up to $490 next year, up to $1215 for brand name drugs. Something else that's changing for people with extra help next year is a special enrollment period. All people with extra help get a special enrollment period to change their Medicare plan outside of this annual election period. But next year, it's going to work much differently than it has the last several years. So starting next year, all people with extra help will be able to change their plan as often as monthly to be in a new plan to be effective the first of the next month. But that switch will only allow people to enroll into a standalone Part D plan. So for instance, if you're on original Medicare and you have a standalone plan and you have extra help, you can enroll in another plan next year at any time, another standalone plan. If you're in a Medicare Advantage plan with Part D and you have extra help, you can enroll at any time next year into, again, a standalone plan, which will put you into original Medicare. What you cannot do next year for the special enrollment period for, with extra help is to enroll into a Medicare Advantage plan. Not, cannot. This special enrollment period will instead be limited to only enrolling into standalone Part D plans that work with original Medicare. And then EPIC is for New York State residents 
that are 65 and over that have incomes of up to 75,000 for a single, up to $100,000 for a married couple. Epic does not work on its own. Epic only works as a supplement to your Part D plan. And it works with every Part D plan, whether you have a Part D plan through your Medicare Advantage plan, or you have a separate one with original Medicare, doesn't matter, it's all Part D. Where Part D is your primary, your main insurance, Epic wraps around. Epic helps to fill in the gaps in coverage. But there's one gap that Epic will not help with, and that is your deductible. So we said plans next year can have a, up to a 590 deductible. Epic's not paying that. But once you meet the deductible, Epic can help lower your copayments. And you know what Epic costs? For most people, it's a free program. So to give you an idea, if you're a single person, you had an income from last year between 20 and 75,000, like many people in New York State did, you would be an Epic's deductible plan. You don't have to pay anything for Epic but you'll have to meet a deductible on a sliding scale based on your income before Epic will help pay for your drugs. But whenever I meet somebody that has Part D and they have an income, let's say, $30,000, $60,000, $60, I tell them, I don't see any reason for you not to sign up for Epic. But sometimes they say to me, you know, I, I don't use a lot of drugs. I'm never going to meet this deductible. It's $1,000. It's $1,500. But I would say, so what? You don't meet the deductible. It's free coverage. In the meantime, you have Epic in place should your situation change. And let me tell you another benefit of Epic. Unlike most people who can only change their plan this time of year, Epic members can change their plan, including a Medicare Advantage plan, one additional time each year outside of the enrollment period. So for some people, it's worth it to join Epic, not for the drug coverage at all, but just to be able to change plans without having to wait till the next year. And if you're not an EPIC member already, you can sign up anytime. There are paper applications that you can use to apply for EPIC, but recently they added a new online application, which is available at this link. And what's really good about that is when you apply online, as soon as you submit it, automatically, instantly, you will get an EPIC ID number, beginning EP for EPIC, followed by a series of numbers. And then you could take that EPIC ID number go to Medicare and use the special enrollment period to enroll or switch your Medicare plan. And then last but not least is the Medicare Savings Program. The Medicare Savings Program for people that qualify and apply, the state will actually pay your Part B premium. It'll put that 185 next year back into your monthly social security check. If you know somebody that has Part B, and they're not paying a premium, they're already on the Medicare Savings Program. But if not, they may qualify. The first Medicare Savings Program they might qualify is the QMB program, with incomes up to $17.52 a month for a single, $23.71 a month for a couple. That program not only pays the Part B premium, but it also eliminates your responsibility for any Part A or Part B cautionary. So if you are on original Medicare, for instance, and you also have QMB, doctors are not allowed to bill you that 20% coinsurance. Okay? Even if they don't take Medicaid, even if they never heard of QMB, doesn't matter. You have QMB, they cannot bill you the Medicare Part A or Part B cost sharing. If your income is above the QMB, though, you might still qualify for the QI program. That program, up to $23.55 a month for a single, $31.89 a month for a couple, pays the Part B premium. And both of these programs make you automatically eligible for extra help with Part D. And there are a few advantages to living in New York State when it comes to the Medicare Savings Program. First of all, excuse me, last year they increased the income limit substantially. So many more people qualify for this program than ever before. And in New York State, they don't look at assets or resources. Whatever money you have in the bank, not concerned about that. Only income to qualify. On top of that, even if your income's too high, you might still qualify. Because if you're paying privately for health insurance, they allow you to deduct your health insurance premium from your income to be eligible. You cannot deduct the Part B premium. You cannot. 
because this program pays the Part B premium. So they look at your gross Social Security before the premium is deducted. But other premiums you can deduct, such as a Medigap plan premium. Some people have long-term care insurance. That can be very expensive. You can deduct that premium. Other times you meet people whose income is only slightly above the limit, five, ten, fifteen dollars. For that person, it'd be worth it to buy some cheap dental policy or vision policy. You ever see them advertised? Twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars a month, whether you need it or not. Because paying that twenty-five dollars a month, now you're automatically qualifying for a program that can pay $185 a month for your Part B premium next year and make you eligible for extra help where you can have no premium for your Part D plan and only small copayments. And you know those small copayments here, the 490 and 1215? If you have Epic on top of that, Epic will waive your fee. You don't have to pay anything for Epic. And Epic will reduce those extra copayments to an even $3 at the pharmacy. And then lastly for today, I just want to give you some resources for assistance for those that live in New York City that have questions on Medicare. They can call the Department for the Aging, 212-AGING-NYC. For those that live outside of New York City but within New York State, they can call the phone number on the back of their Medicare and You handbook. Um, the 1-800-701-0501 and put in their zip code to be directed to their local county for assistance. For those that live outside of New York State or are considering moving outside of New York State, you can find a local counselor in your um, state or territory at the shiphelp.org website. If you want to learn more about Medicare and related health insurance, you're welcome to come to one of our Introduction to Medicare webinars. You, this link has the schedule and to register. It's available for everybody, but we encourage the webinars for people that are new to Medicare or may be retiring after 65. And then this year, we're, we're doing a series of Medicare Advantage plan panel marketing meetings. We have meetings coming up in the Bronx and in downtown Brooklyn. You can see our schedule and register to attend. And this is a really unique opportunity to hear from multiple Medicare Advantage plans all in one setting where you can compare between the different plans as they sit, representatives sit on a panel. So this could be very helpful for people that are considering Medicare Advantage for next year or are thinking about switching their Medicare Advantage plan for the new year. So I know that's a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. I'm happy to spend the rest of the time addressing your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. As always, so thorough, so much information to absorb, so many details. But again, for everyone, remember, you're getting all the information sent to you um, within a day or two. So it will have the links to the various resources that are being listed in chat, Eric's PowerPoint presentation, uh, including the final screen, which talks about additional um, ways to find out information with calls or additional webinars or in-person meetings. So we have not a lot of time left because we have to close at exactly 3.30 at the latest. And we have a huge amount of questions. So I'm just going to try to dig into as many as we can get to. But truthfully, Eric already answered many, many, many of the questions in his presentation. Um, so I am going to just look through quickly to try to make sure. Um, so maybe I'll sort of tie these things together because people have raised questions about their costs going up for their prescription D plan significantly, and the number of people gave different examples, but there's also this new out-of-pocket cap on prescription drugs. And so, Eric, help us understand what's the best way for any individual to evaluate, you know, is this a plus or a minus for them? Because I guess it could be one or the other, depending on how much you're now spending on drugs. And some people don't use that much drug coverage at all. So what's your best? Right. 
So, yeah. so for some people, that that's a good question to ask and an understandable concern. So it's it's very individual, like you're saying. For some people, they benefit from the two thousand out of pocket cost if they have very high out of pocket cost. For other people, much less so because they have very little or no drug costs that they're anticipating for the year, and they're just paying a premium just to have the insurance should their needs change during the year. But for those that use medications, I would recommend going to the Medicare website, entering your drugs and your pharmacy to get an estimate of your cost. Because the premium is just one factor. You know, you have to look at, at the formulary and the network of pharmacies, and that search tool will make that comparison for you to see if you want to stay with the same plan for next year or if another plan might be better for you. Thank you. Another pretty common question is, I have traditional Medicare and maybe I have some kind of supplemental insurance, but I don't have any restrictions on what doctors to see and I don't need referrals. Am I giving that up if I switch to Medicare Advantage plans? Yeah, if you're on original traditional Medicare, you have the most choice of doctors and hospitals across the United States. Okay, that's why people choose original, traditional Medicare. Okay, but it comes at a cost, because if you don't have retiree health insurance and you don't have Medicaid, you have to purchase a private Medigap plan and a separate Part D plan. So you're paying more in premiums to have the most choice and flexibility in your coverage. With a Medicare Advantage plan, you could save on those premiums, plus you get some additional benefits but you need to be able to work within a network of providers, doctors and hospitals. If it's an HMO plan, it may also require some plans, not all, a referrals to see specialists in their network. If it's a PPO plan though, PPO plans by definition do not require referrals to see specialists in network. And I know you, you talked about this, but just clarify again. So I have one of the Medicare Advantage plans that is supposedly being discontinued in 2025. Yeah. Can I switch back to standard Medicare or do I have to just pick a different Advantage plan? No, like all people with Medicare, it's a choice whether you want to be on original Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan. But if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan currently and your plan is terminating, unless you choose another Medicare Advantage plan, by default, you'll be on original traditional Medicare, January 1. If you have extra help, you will be assigned to a Part D plan. But I'm worried about the people like that have a Medicare Advantage plan whose plan is terminating who don't have extra help. Because January 1, if they don't pick a new plan, they're going to wind up on original Medicare and they will have no prescription drug coverage at all. And even though you said they're, can't, they're, they're not continuing certain plans, but the same companies have other plans, it just means then you're going to have lesser options? I mean, with why are they canceling my plan but saying, oh, but I have two others you can choose from? What does that mean? It, yeah, so the, the same company, uh, they're, they're terminating some of the plans that they offer, but they have other plans still. So United Healthcare still has multiple plans for next year, WellCare, and Aetna. So what's, what I would say, the first thing we would recommend is when a person's on one of these plans and the plan is terminating, contact the insurer to see if another plan from the same company might work. Because most people in this situation, if the plan went to terminate it, they would still be on the plan next year, right? With the same insurance company. So I would start there because unfortunately, the letters that people get from the plans that are terminating, these are standard letters, they list on pages of other companies' plans. And they list all this information about Medigap insurance but they don't tell you in that letter that there are other plans from the same insurance company. So that's, that's why we want to, that's why we always start with that in our counseling. 
Right. So I was going to say that I think that's one of the real advantages of talking to a high cap counselor because they actually can lay it out side by side for you and talk to you about, well, you use this kind of health care or you know you're going to need this or you use this kind of, you know, these drugs. So they they can probably help you do side by side comparisons more easily than you might be able to do them yourself. Is that right? Yeah, so that's that's something that our counselors um, do consistently this time of year. And with but I would say if you're looking at a new Medicare Advantage plan insurer for next year, since there are many insurers that offer these plans, before calling us, check with your doctors. You know, most people we speak to, they're committed to a particular doctor or doctors. Find out which Medicare Advantage plans they participate in, because I bet they don't take all of them. And then that'll help us to narrow down and help you to narrow down your decision. And then we can help amongst the plans the doctors do take, do take to make a comparison. So that raises another common question. So you pick a plan based on they, they work with the doctors you work with. And then sometime during the year, either your doctor stops taking that plan or that plan refuses to deal with that doctor. Um, what do you do then? Right, so that's a good question. So with the Medicare Advantage plan, it's a network of providers. Most doctors and hospitals that are in a plan's network will remain with the plan for the, at least the remainder of the calendar year. But sometimes it's possible that your doctor or hospital will stop participating with the plan. And if they do, unfortunately, you do not get an opportunity to switch plans for that reason, cannot. There might be another reason you're able to switch. So for instance, if it was during that January through March enrollment period, you could switch plans then or to original Medicare. If you have extra help, you could switch to original Medicare at any time. If you're somebody that has EPIC, you can switch one time during the year, but you cannot change plans just because your doctor stops taking the plan during the year. So I asked it in the context of an individual doctor. Suppose you are receiving some kind of long-term care in a specific hospital, let's say cancer care, um, let's say Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is well known for cancer care and is in my district. Um, what happens if the plan you chose doesn't allow you to continue the care you're getting at Memorial Sloan Kettering or doesn't have Memorial in their network? What, what's your best advice there? So if, if somebody wants to use Memorial Sloan Kettering, historically, they have not participated with most of the Medicare Advantage plans. They take original Medicare because all the hospitals take original Medicare. And that's a reason why somebody may want to have original Medicare. If they're in a Medicare Advantage plan, they would have to check if Memorial Sloan Kettering is participating. So for instance, um, there might be people uh, today that have a, a plan with Anthem, right? Which is the new name for Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Anthem, excuse me, Memorial Sloan Kettering sent letters to Anthem members to tell them as of the end of this year that they will no longer be participating with Anthem. But it's possible that we've seen this before with other hospital networks, and sometimes they're able to reach an agreement. But if they don't, then people will not be able to continue with them okay, if they want to remain with Anthem. Now, what they said, though, in their notice from Memorial Sloan Kettering is that they have this 60-day cooling off period. So even if they don't reach an agreement by the end of the year, they'll still honor Anthem for January and February. And what they also said on the Memorial Sloan Kettering website is that if somebody's in the middle of treatment, that they will continue to provide treatment. That's what the hospital has said. Okay, And you'll see that on the Memorial Sloan Kettering website when you look at the information they're posting about Anthem. Got it. And I know you want, you answered this question. I'm gonna 
have us go over it again because it's always a confusion to people. So explain again that if you're already, if you're still working when you turn 65, you right. don't have to sign anything for Medicare or take any action or you're something you do have to take. Right. So if you're covered under your active employment when you turn 65, especially if it's for a large employer, where for Medicare, that means an employer of 20 or more individuals, the employer insurance is primary. Okay? Medicare would be secondary. For most people, it's not worth it to pay the Part B premium to have Medicare as a second insurance. So they are able to delay enrollment in Part B without penalty and then sign up later when they stop working. That's using that special enrollment period that I spoke about before. Now, people might want to take Part A at 65. They don't have to unless they're collecting Social Security. But if they have a health savings account at work, so some people have a high deductible health plan where it's, it's several thousand dollars of deductible, and connected to that is a health savings account, HSA where they're able to use pre-tax dollars to pay for medical expenses. The IRS has a rule that if you enroll in Medicare, even though it's Part A only, you can no longer continue to contribute to the health savings account tax-free. Okay? That's a reason not to take Part A if you're contributing to an HSA at work. But if you don't have a health savings account, there's no reason not to take Part A. So it's very common for people that we speak to that are employees, or spouses of employees of the city of New York turn 65, they take A, delay B, when they are the spouse retires in the future, they sign up for Part B then. And do you have to, even though you're still working and you have insurance, do you have to notify Medicare of, of that fact or you just keep working and at some point you don't and then you make your application for Medicare, but there's no penalty risk because you were working up till that time. Is that right? Yeah, right, right. So the latter. So if you only need to notify Medicare, Social Security actually, because they do the enrollment to Medicare at the point that you want to enroll in Medicare. Okay, that's when you need to notify Social Security. And for people that are working past 65 or covered under spouses still working, there's a form that your employer will need to fill out to confirm that you've been covered through active employment since 65. And then you'll present that to Social Security, and that's how they know they can enroll you without having to wait and without being subject to a penalty. Got it. And if you're currently on your spouse's private employment, employer health care plan um, and then something happens with their employment that's then also when you need to reach out for Medicare um, for covering right. that's for you same story. yeah so if you're covered under your spouse's active employment since 65 and now your spouse stops working you should sign up for Medicare if you don't have your own health insurance from work because Medicare is now becoming your primary, your main insurance. Right. Now, I just want to add one detail. There's always another detail you can add. And this is for federal retirees. Okay? Retirees of the federal government, their situation is a little unique. Because federal retirees, like retirees of the Postal Service, for instance, their coverage can work without Medicare. Many federal retirees never sign up for Part B. And they continue to have the same federal coverages when they were working, same premium, same co-payments. But like any retiree, if they change their mind later, they have to wait for Part B to start, and they're subject to a penalty. But retirees from anywhere other than the federal government, they really need to enroll in Part B and Part A because that's their primary, their main insurance when you're retired and you're not covered under a spouse's working. So you've been covered by your spouse's insurance, but things haven't gone well in the marriage and you've split and somehow your spouse cancels your insurance with you. So how are you going to get proof for Medicaid care 
that now you need it, but you've been covered, but now you're not because it's not your employer who you are no longer getting insurance from. It's actually perhaps a hostile spouse or a house during a divorce situation. Right. So if you're not able to go to your ex-spouse's or uh, form employer to get that information, if they're not able to fill out the form for you, then there's other... Um, you could fill out the form and don't sign it, though, because that's for the employer to sign, and then submit a supporting document to show that you've been covered under your spouse's active employment. And on the Social Security website, there's a list of what they would accept as supporting documents. And is that employer allowed to cancel your insurance at the request of your now hostile spouse if you're still married? Well, I, I would say that's between the, the employee and the employer as to what they're as to what they're able to do. It's not really a question for Medicare. No, it isn't a question for Medicare. It just got me thinking about that. Um, <laughs> okay. Sorry. I was just, you know, playing out the storyline a little further. Um, just double checking, there's no resource limit for Medicare savings and related programs, or there is. For the Medicare savings program, if you live in New York State. They don't have an asset or resource test. Um, do special, I'm sorry, do Medicare savings pay for insurance premiums? The, the Medicare savings program just pays the Part B premium. But if you get the Medicare savings program, automatically you get another benefit. You get extra help. Extra help provides a subsidy that could be applied towards your Medicare Part D drug plan premium. Great. Great. Okay. I'm just looking through additional questions that have come in. Ah, I knew this one was going to come up. So do we expect all the presentation materials today are going to be affected by the incoming administration after January 20th in the new year? Yes, I, I was saying that, you know, I've been getting these, this question a lot, you know, since the election, understandably. What I would say to people is that Medicare, it's a federal health insurance program. Congress can always pass laws to change the Medicare program, as they have done in the years that I've been doing this. The program has changed a lot. So, but the Congress has not passed laws to change the program from what I'm describing today. And you have to make decisions based on how the program works now, not on how you feel it might change in the future. So the information that I'm providing for you today is what you need to make, is what is the basis for what you need to make a decision, a good decision for 2025. If people are concerned about how the program might change, um, I would suggest speaking to your federal elected official to let them know your concerns about changes uh, to the Medicare program. But until that changes, it works the way it works now. And again, I'll emphasize any significant changes in Medicare should require acts of Congress, and that will involve all of our legislators in Washington so you always should feel free to contact your legislators in Congress, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, and the new president um, with your positions on Medicare and how concerned you would be to see reductions or perhaps you want to propose additions to Medicare to the new Congress and the new president. I always think that's a good idea. Um, and I know you talked about this, but just another clarification. Some people don't quite understand what this $2,000 cap means. Could you explain that? Sure. So this is a big change for next year. For the first time, Medicare Part D will have an out-of-pocket limit. They never had that before. So next year, it's going to be an even $2,000. So the $2,000, just to be clear, does not include the premium you pay to be a member of the plan, does not. It includes what you pay at the pharmacy, deductible, copayment, coinsurance, and it's only 
towards drugs that are covered. If your drug is not covered by the plan, it's not going towards that 2000. The 2000 is only for covered drugs. You're part of the cost. Again, your part, your cost sharing, deductible, copay, coinsurance, that's what's going towards the 2000. And if you reach that 2000, you would have complete coverage, 100% for the remainder of the calendar year for all Part D covered drugs. Now, there's been some changes or attempted changes by the city of New York for retirees to change the health insurance coverage for people who retired as city employees and what kind of additional coverage they would be continuing to get. I know there's been lawsuits, there's been stops and starts. If you're someone who's approaching 65 and or later, but retiring from the city of New York, do you have any specific new recommendations on how to approach evaluating decisions because of your unique situation as a city retiree? Well, for New York City retirees, and we speak to many of them, what I would suggest, a couple of things to know. First of all, because of the lawsuits, like you said, things are just status quo at the moment. And most of the city retirees have the GHI senior care that I mentioned that acts as a supplement to original Medicare. The reason they have that is for choice of providers, right? So if they're spending half the year in Florida or Arizona, they have the same coverage they have here in New York. That's why they do this. And there's no additional premium that they pay for that. And for City of New York retirees, whether they have the GHI Senior Care or any other City of New York retiree plan, they are entitled to reimbursement of the Part B premium, including the higher IRMA premium that I mentioned earlier. So this is a great benefit that they receive. They have to lay out the premium, but then, <clears throat> excuse me, the following year, they get reimbursed for that premium. The standard Part B premium, they would get reimbursed for automatically each year after submitting a form the first time. But the IRMA, the higher premium, they would have to reapply for each year to get reimbursement for that. A very important benefit for all City of New York retirees that have health insurance as a retiree benefit. Again, whether it's the GHI Senior Care or any other New York City retiree health plan. Yes. My husband's a retiree from the city of New York. I can vouch for that. Um, okay. <laughs> thank you. So you talked about how F is the most expensive plan, but how does a person evaluate whether that one's worth it to them? Because that one is significantly more expensive. It, right. So Medigap Plan F is the most comprehensive Medigap plan. I'll just go back to the Medigap chart. It offers the most benefits. But the Medigap Plan F is only available to people that became Medicare eligible prior to 2020. So if you have original Medicare and Medigap Plan F, you have 100% coverage for all Medicare covered services, but it comes at a high premium. If you want to compare, let's say F and G, the only difference we said with plan G is it doesn't cover the Part B deductible. How much is the Part B deductible? Next year it's 257. But if you look at the difference in premium over the course of the year, you might save 500 to $600 in premium by switching to G. So you're paying with Plan F, you're paying five to $600 more in premium for a benefit of $257. That's the argument some people will make in favor of Plan G over Plan F. Now, another thing that I'm telling people that are thinking about making that change from F to G, if you're anticipating medical expenses at the beginning of the year, here's a suggestion. Why don't you wait until your Plan F pays the Part B deductible for you next year, and then switch, right? That's the advantage of living in New York State. You'll save even more okay? when you switch to G after F has paid the deductible for you for the year. Great hints. 
See, that's why we ask you all the questions, because mm -hmm. okay. think about that as the answer. Thank you. Just double checking questions that are still coming in. Um, and oh, somebody who had asked a question about what we were saying about what happens in January 25. And the answer is none of us know now what's going to happen other than any significant changes in Medicare policy will require legislative action going through both houses of the U.S. Congress and the Senate. So we will hear proposals, likely quite a few come January, and then we will see how this plays out. And we can all use our voices as citizens receiving Medicare or soon to be eligible for Medicare to voice our strong opinions to Congress and the president. And yes, somebody commented, do I really think that's going to be useful with the new president? And my answer is, our job is to push as hard as we can for what we believe is the right answer for Americans, whether we think we're going to get a positive response or not. Um, and frankly, the number of Americans who are dependent for their health care on Medicare and on their retirement for Social Security, no matter what people say during campaigns, and they said a lot of strange things during campaigns, the fact is that older New York, older Americans, not just New Yorkers, are a huge voting block in this country, and they need to make their voices heard loud and clear. And it's not what Eric does for a living, but there are also other organizations, and we have worked with them and will continue to work with them, who organize older people's voices to be heard by their legislators. And I would urge everybody um, to get involved and know what is going on and contact their legislators when there are trigger issues um, or proposals being moved that could do great harm to large numbers of Americans. So both Medicare and Social Security, I think our job is to keep our eyes open and voice our concerns. And frankly, there's power in numbers, so work in unity. I know there are a number of citywide, statewide, and national organizations for older New Yorkers that are very proactive on keeping track of proposals in Washington and letting them, letting us know about that, them. So I don't know if my staff can put everybody's resource list up now because it wasn't necessarily one we thought about, but we'll make sure in the resources we send out to people that we include lists of groups who do work on serious federal issues impacting older adults and make sure that that information is included as well in case you would like to reach out or become on the come on the email list etc and i'm also probably pretty sure that if proposals start floating out there we will hear about it in my office and we will also make sure through our updates and our websites that we're also letting you know looks like this is working its way through at the federal level we need to a push um right now uh, we need to push back right now we need to support something right now um because again none of this can be taken lightly by anyone it affects the livelihood and the health of millions and millions of americans uh, yes, I'm uh, getting notes in, in, in the Q&A. We want to know who those groups are. We'll make sure that we get you those info, those answers. Oh, goodness. It's 325. So now I have to thank Eric profusely thank you. for his time and expertise, um, helping us all understand this better. Um, you know, I just don't know how you absorb all this information and can explain it so clearly, but we're so delighted that you're a resource for us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who attended the town hall today. And again, you'll be getting follow-up email information from us soon. And please fill out the event survey. 
because we always want to keep track of what people found valuable, not valuable, and fine tune the presentations we make to you all. I want to remind you that our next town hall is going to be on scam protection, S-C-A-M, scams. This event will be Thursday, November 14th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. You'll hear about the newest scams. There are a lot of new scams. Why so many of us are susceptible to falling for these scams and how to best protect yourself. If you want to register for the event, you can email us at lkruger at nysenate.gov or call my office 212-490-9535. You can ask for Wendy. As always, I want to thank all of my staff for pulling these together, for being my eyes and ears in the community, but also knowing how to get the most and best information to you all as quickly as possible. Um, I just wanna say thank you for joining us. And also remember to get your COVID and flu vaccines if you haven't done so already. Believe it or not, there are states that are actually outlawing vaccines already. Don't buy any of that crap. This is science, this is proven science. Particularly as we get older, the importance of vaccines cannot be emphasized enough. It's easy to get vaccines here in New York City, and so please do so. And it was great being with you all today. Thank you so much. Bye.